So this is, this is my talk for bootstrapping embedded development in Rust. And this is don't let your dreams be dreams. Uh, one of the big things is uh, there's not a lot of people using Rust on embedded right now, let alone full Rust or in combination with another language like C or C++. So I wanted to give a, an introduction and guide on how you can get started in embedded on Rust a lot faster. Uh, and again, if you have any questions, feel free to stop me. Um, yeah, I'm happy to answer any questions either during or after the presentation. So who am I? I'm James. Uh, I'm an embedded systems engineer. Uh, I grew up in the US and moved to Berlin about three years ago. Uh, my background's primarily in safety critical embedded systems um, until I moved to Berlin. And then I got into the IoT scene here. So I'm working for a company now called Genie, which is a branch of Telefonica, a very large telecom company. Um, and we're working on our IoT platform, Genie. Um, so I'm not doing this as part of my employer. So opinions expressed here are my own and all that good stuff. So, uh, what are embedded systems? I heard some people with different, uh, programming backgrounds. So I wanted to explain what embedded systems are kind of from a high level. So when I talk about Im embedded systems, there's kind of a couple pieces of important vocabulary. So there's microprocessors. So when you think the CPU in your computer, you're probably talking about a microprocessor. This is kind of a dedicated component that does computing really well, but it's not totally integrated. It typically has a lot of things that are important to what you think a computer is outside of the CPU. So things like RAM and persistent storage, like a hard drive or things like that. Um, those are all off of the CPU. Uh, to contrast that, there are things that are called microcontrollers, and these are typically much simpler, much low, lower power, lower resource systems, um, but they're typically much simpler and much more tightly integrated. So when we talk about embedded systems, uh, I kind of define those as any computer you don't sit in front of. So your laptop in front of you or a server that's sitting in a closet, those aren't really embedded systems. Those are general purpose computers. Um, when you get to something like the wireless router you have in home, that's still running Linux and it's still running on a processor, but it's getting much closer to an embedded system because it's doing kind of one thing and it's doing it really well. Um, as you get lower and lower, you get into things like keyboards and the thermostat in your house and Arduinos and Fitbits and all of those kind of things. Um, those are typically what I would call embedded systems. Um, another important concept here is operating systems. Most people are familiar with desktop operating systems, things like uh, Windows or Linux or OS X. Um, there's also operating systems for microcontrollers as well. These are typically called real-time operating systems. They're, they're much smaller, much more lightweight, but they give you the same kind of features from a high level, the ability to schedule multiple tasks at the same time, provide some memory management and those kind of things. And the opposite of that, typically you only see in embedded systems are bare metal systems. So these are systems that have no abstraction between you and the hardware. It's basically just one program or application that you're putting directly onto your piece of bare metal hardware and it controls the hardware, it runs your firmware, it runs all of that. So that's what I mean by a bare metal system. So there are a lot of different kinds of uh, embedded systems, but I've kind of tried to group them into four big groups here. So when you have a micro microprocessor system and you've got an operating system, um, this is usually what you're used to, either your desktop PC or something like a Raspberry Pi. Um, this is really, for all intents and purposes, still a full computer. Um, and I put it in red here because it's less interesting to our talk today. Because if you have a full operating system and you have Linux and you have a lot of resources and memory and hard drive space, Rust probably already works for you. You probably don't need a whole lot of help. You can probably just use Rust up and install Rust and start working the way you're used to. Um, if you stay in a microprocessor system, but you're going to bare metal, this is a slightly different case. This is something that's kind of a high performance, very specialized system. This might be something like the hard drive controller in your hard drive or um, a high speed data acquisition system if you're doing um, something really time critical where you can't afford to have an operating system between you and your CPU. Kind of going the other way, um, there are also microcontroller systems that have operating systems. These are again using these real-time operating systems. This might be something like Free RTOS, if you've heard of that, or Zephyr or Riot. There's, there's a real variety of RTOSs that are suited to 
different applications. And these are really commonly used for safety critical systems where it's important to keep track of how long you're spending on different things, or if you have a networked or complex embedded system. So IoT devices typically fall into this because they're doing things like managing sensors or managing outputs while also dealing with network, which is kind of a, an asynchronous kind of thing. And then kind of on the far right bottom, you've got a microcontroller system running on bare metal. This is super common for very simple embedded systems. And I put this in green because this is where our talk today kind of focuses the most on. I think the concepts I go over today will help you with the two yellow zones, especially if you have to bring up a system that's weird and no one's gotten rust running on it before. But um, the demo that I'm gonna give today is a bare metal microcontroller system. So again, just for background, I've tried to include some typical system specs for each of these classes of systems. So your high-end microprocessor system, again, I said, think Raspberry Pi. You've got a couple cores, you've got a one gigahertz clock, maybe you're 32 or 64 bit, you've got gigabytes of RAM, gigabytes of storage. Um, when you move to your low-end microprocessor system, like your wireless router, you're taking a big step down, you're going to single core, you're talking hundreds of megahertz instead of gigahertz, and maybe you aren't 64-bit anymore. And again, you're stepping down into megabytes of storage and RAM. So this is kind of your general purpose, but still powerful embedded system. This is your wireless router. A Game Boy Advance is a, is a good example of this. Uh, as you move down, you get into high-end microcontroller systems that probably 10 years ago, we wouldn't have thought of them as microcontrollers. They would have been high-end CPUs, but today they're the low-power, high-end microcontroller systems. These are capable of doing some digital signal processing, um, connecting to complex networks like TCP IP networks, those kind of things. So again, you're taking a step down, you're probably changing your architecture from x86 to MIPS or ARM or something like that. And again, you've stepped down to kilobytes of RAM and megabytes of flash. And then at the very, very bottom, you've got these low end kind of purpose specific microcontroller systems. And that's the system we'll be working with today. Something that has maybe tens of megahertz of CPU, probably 32 bit, but there's a lot of eight and 16 bit systems still out there and some kilobytes of RAM and anywhere from zero to a couple hundred kilobytes of persistent flash storage. These are kind of the devices that are behind the scene everywhere you look and you probably don't even think of them as computers, but they're still running software and they still got hardware. So this is your thermostat, Fitbit, gas meter, Arduino kind of device. So how does Rust fit in all this? Well, a lot of people, especially if you've read message boards or news articles, they describe Rust as a systems language. But what does that mean? That's kind of just as fuzzy of a term as embedded systems. Well, to me, what makes a language a systems language is that there's very little sugar or management between this code you write and the hardware you're interacting with. Uh, Rust in particular has no garbage collection, which is important especially for real-time systems, you don't want your system running off and collecting memory while you're trying to be doing something like checking whether you should set a smoke alarm off or something like that. Uh, it has no language runtime. When you call a function that's directly executing code, there's very little virtualization, something like a Python or a JavaScript where you have an entire engine running behind the scenes that's taking what you're asking it to do and making its own decisions on how to actually execute that. Uh, systems languages typically have a well-separated stack and heap. So anyone who's worked in C before knows kind of the difference between stack memory and heap memory. This is the difference between something when you enter a function and a variable get declared that kind of magically appears, and that typically magically appears on the stack. And when you do dynamic memory allocation, something like malloc in C or new in C++ or anything in Go generally, that's something that's going to be put on the heap or dynamically allocated memory regions. Uh, Rust is also a language that's capable of direct memory access and control. When you're dealing with embedded systems, uh, a lot of the hardware that's going on, the way that you interact with it is by directly putting bits and bytes at direct memory addresses. So there's no functions to call, there's no syscall. It's if I wanna configure something, I'm putting this structure at this memory location. And Rust is a particularly good systems language, in my opinion, because many of the language features or the compelling reasons why you would want to choose Rust are implemented completely at compile time. Things like the borrow checker, reference counting, um, a lot of the generic methods and things like that. Very little of this, that actually exists in code that's running at runtime, which means especially for these low power systems, you can offload the hard stuff onto your high power development machine rather than 
on your tiny, tiny eight megahertz processor that's only got 8K of RAM. So everyone here said that they have a little bit of experience in Rust, but if you haven't dug too deep, you may not have run into the difference between core and core plus standard. So Rust is broken up in kind of two parts, similar to how C++ is with the C++ standard library versus what you would think of as just C++. So in Rust, what the core of the uh, language is, is things like the anything that happens at compile time, so your borrow checker and compiler. Your basic language components like for loops, pattern matching, having the ability to use traits, generics, even uh, the monad types like option and error, those are all implemented by the compiler and in the core of the language. These are kind of non-optional parts of C. Also a couple other crates like mem and pointer and things that we'll need later. Also any crate that you run into on crates.io that says that it supports no standard, that means that it can run without the assistance of the standard library, which is gonna be relevant later. Now there's a lot of things you've probably been using in Rust that are part of Rust standard library. Anytime you've used printline, this is part of the standard library. Anytime you've had to spin up threads, they're OS threads, so this is in the standard library. Anything with heap allocations, hash maps, link lists, sockets, addressing, and most crates you run into rely on the standard library, either because they directly use some functionality from it, or they rely on something provided by Rust that indirectly depends on the standard library. And a lot of this is heap allocations. And generally, anytime you see a feature in Rust that you could step back and say, well, under the scenes, it's probably really the operating system handling that. Things like writing to a file or opening a socket. Any of that's generally going to be part of the standard library. And I bring this up because when you're running on a bare metal system, you don't have an operating system there to help you out. So really, there's no implementation of standard because you'd have to have a version of standard for every environment and every tiny operating system that exists out there. So most of the time when we're talking about using Rust on embedded systems, we're talking about just the core components of the library, which does still leave a lot. So welcome to no standard programming. This might be your first introduction, but if you keep working with microcontrollers in Rust, you'll get very comfortable very quickly. And these kind of concepts are also very useful, even on desktop PCs, if you're looking to implement something in the kernel or something with very low overhead, or there's a couple other, or if you're developing an operating system, for example, in Rust you're gonna be living in the no standard space. So we have this great language that's compatible with microcontrollers. We have systems language, so great. Let's just rewrite everything in Rust. That's a cool thing to do, right? Well, one thing I didn't really introduce is what goes into firmware for these components. So there's the part you think of as, hey, I have to write some software. That's your application. This is the kind of project specific or business logic part of your program. I'm gonna read from this sensor, I'm gonna do something with this sensor data, and I'm gonna send it out over the network. That's kind of your domain-specific application. You've got libraries, these are probably high-level libraries, things like serializing and deserializing data, um, maybe even entire UDP, TCP, or some more complex network stack component. You've got your operating system, which again, I've said is completely optional. Um, and then you've got your low-level drivers, or what are typically referred to as hardware abstraction layer. This is saying, I want to send these bytes over that serial port. So that way you're not manually interacting with the hardware, you're calling a function. You've got your processor definition. This is things like, where do my serial ports exist in memory? What are they at hex address 2000000? Uh, where do I put them and how do I interact with them? So this is something that's provided by the manufacturer. Um, and then most importantly, you've got your make file and build projects. These are all the tiny little uh, compilation settings that seem way less important than the code, but without them, your code has no idea, or your compiler has no idea how to turn that code and make it work on your specific system. So I say all of these things go into firmware, but the reason why we can't generally jump straight to Rust from day one is anything that's in red here now is typically provided by either the, by open source projects or the manufacturer. That blue part that's the application, that's the part that you were going to sit down and write anyway. So you're expecting to write that anyway, but if before you even got to that, you had to implement all of these things sitting underneath it, that could make your project a lot longer than you think it could be. And you may not even have the experience if you're a high level uh, embedded systems programmer. Maybe you've never written an operating system before. Maybe you've never written a direct driver before. Now, 
these components are not always amazing when they're given to you by the manufacturer. And sometimes they're not even great. Um, but typically they usually work out of the box and they're a good starting place. You can get something up and going today. And then kind of, if you realize that you're hitting some uh, limitations in those, you can go back and re-implement those parts. But if you're starting from nothing on day one, that can be a pretty steep hill to climb. Or if you're trying to propose this at work, it can be difficult to make the case to your manager or whoever to say, yes, I want to start from completely stage one and rewrite all of my drivers and all of my operating system. Don't worry that that stuff exists somewhere else. But then the question is, how can you start today before you rewrite the entire world in Rust? Well, I'm glad you asked. So there's a lot of tooling out there. Some of it was specifically developed for embedded systems in Rust. Some was just for embedded systems. Some was just for Rust and people didn't think that it could be used for embedded systems. Um, so I'm gonna go over a couple of those in detail and I'm going to skim over a couple of those. And for all of these, I'm gonna try and give a good overview of what the tool is called, kind of the use case of this tool. So if you find yourself running into this problem in three months from now, you don't remember this, you can skim through the presentation and go, ah, that's what I wanna be doing. Cool, I can go and look at the documentation for that and learn more because I don't remember anything from that presentation. So kind of the first one out of the gate is a tool called Zargo. So if you've used Rust, you're probably familiar with Cargo, which is providing package management and compilation. Uh, it's kind of your interface to the Rust compiler or Rust C. Uh, but the problem is Cargo only knows about a handful of uh, platforms. So x86, x86-64, some of the more uh, common architectures like the bigger ARM processors, it knows about those. It already has the standard library and core built for those. However, when you're going for kind of a more edge case system like a microcontroller, you actually need to start from the Rust source and compile the core components of the Rust language for your target. Now a guy named Japarik went out and wrote a tool that kind of automates all of this and makes it really easy. So this is just kind of a thin wrapper around Cargo that goes, hey, if you're building for a microcontroller or something that Rust doesn't know about, I'll first I'll go out, pull down the Rust source, cross compile it for the target that you actually need for, and then you'll have that ready to go when you compile the rest of your code. This is really helpful. Um, so there's a link to the repository here and we'll be using it through the presentation. And as a note, you do need to remember to pull down the Rust source. So if you follow the instructions in the guide today, you should already have all of this. So since that's just a thin layer over Cargo, you interact with it exactly the same way as Cargo, so I won't go into too much in that. But the next kind of big stepping stone that I think you'll find really useful if you're trying to get into a Rust embedded system is a concept called Rust build scripts. And these are typically called build.rs. So when you have a crate, but you need it to do other stuff that's not just compiling your one Rust binary, uh, maybe compile some C code too, or com generate some bindings, uh, you'll probably write what's called a, build, a Rust build script. And this is something you just write normal Rust, you put it in your project, you put it in a file called build.rs and put it next to your cargo toml, and it gets run before, it runs after your dependencies have been built, and then before your crate has been compiled. So what this looks like is just normal Rust code. Um, there are some special things that exist there, like environment variables that Cargo will set so you know where to put things, like for example, outdoor. So when you actually build something, you can just pull that in from the environment variables and Cargo will make sure it goes to the right place. Um, but you just call regular Rust code and you do the kind of things that you would typically do in a make file in a C or C++ project, but instead of having to learn a new language like the make syntax, you can just write this in Rust too. Um, and there's a couple of special keywords that you can print out that will instruct Cargo when it's done building saying, hey, I did this, I'm letting you know what I did. If certain things change, make sure that you come back and update me or maybe I update some path variables for you. Like I generated a static library and you can find it here. So there's documentation on the, uh, on the Cargo website that gives you all of these components. But I just wanted to show you that it still looks like fairly normal Rust. The next thing you'll need that you probably haven't run into if you're just developing Rust for a desktop or a server um, is a config file called .cargo slash config. So you just make a little folder called .cargo in your project and make a plain text file called config. This is where you can give some more extensive configuration options to Cargo that aren't typically exposed in the cargo.toml or in the command line flags. So something you might put here is you say, hey, when we're building a target for a thumb v7 em none eabhf, 
which is a Cortex M4 processor with a floating point and no operating system. You need to pass these flags to the Rust compiler. And most of these are being passed straight through to either LLVM or whatever you're using as a linker. So a lot of these are linker arguments and things like that that, again, you would normally see in a make file. But this is where we would put them in our, in our use. So the real star of this presentation is a tool called BindGen. And the situation you would want to use BindGen is when you have some C code and you want to call it from your Rust code. Where BindGen comes from is actually the Servo project. So Servo is the project undertaken by Mozilla to kind of make a new, new browser from scratch using Rust. And it, they're kind of using it as their test bed where they're developing a lot of these cool features that they're kind of backporting into Firefox. But when they were starting on day one, they kind of had the same problem that we do. They go, well, we want a browser, but a browser is a really big, complex system. And we can't really just start from scratch and say, yes, we have a browser, but there's no CSS engine or no JavaScript or no anything like that. So they went out and wrote a tool called BindGen, which lets you take an existing C library and automatically generate the Rust bindings to that. So Rust already has the ability to call into C code, but normally if you didn't have a tool like BindGen, it would be a lot of boilerplate where you need to go through all the headers of the library and say, okay, I need to make the Rust equivalent of the C header to this so that my Rust program knows how to communicate with my C program. And they got tired of that boilerplate, so they wrote a really cool tool. So they wrapped their JavaScript rendering engine so that their Rust code could call their JavaScript rendering engine and they could get a lot further, a lot faster until they were ready to rewrite all of the components from Rust. Um, so to show you what this does, on the left, we've got some C code. And so we've got a structure definition. So maybe this is some data types. So you've got a, a struct called cool struct with two integers in it. And you've got a function called cool function. So it takes an integer, a C character, and then a C pointer to one of these cool struct methods. So you could manually rewrite all of this in Rust, but it's already a little tedious for one function, one structure definition, and you have to know how to get all of this right. And there's a lot of room for error if you're writing it from scratch. And trust me, this will multiply a lot. By the time that I'm done generating the BindGen Rust code for the libraries that I'm using in the demonstration we'll get to later, I've generated 35,000 lines of Rust code. So it would take a lot of time and there'd be a lot of room for error if you were writing 35,000 lines of code for any language, let alone code where you're trying to match perfectly some other code. So we have computers to do this. So let's, let's offload this to a tool like BindGen. Now, if you're going the other way, um, there's another tool for that. I'm not using this in my presentation, but I wanted to make sure you knew about it. If you have some Rust code, maybe you've built a Rust library and you're trying to expose the functionality of that Rust library to your existing C or C++ code base, uh, you'd use a, cool, a tool like Rusty Cheddar. This works exactly the same, but in reverse. So you take some Rust code, a Rust structure definition and a Rust function definition, and it will automatically generate the C header definition that you would use to interact with it. Um, there's a couple things you need to make sure you do. Whenever you expose a data type from Rust to C, you need to make sure to tell Cargo, hey, this is gonna be exposed to C, so you need to make sure that it's kept in a C representation. Recently, Rust merged a feature where they will actually reorder structure definitions if they think that it will make your code more performant. And that works great for Rust, where everything's kind of transparent to what the layout is, but if you're interacting with C, you need to be really careful that you're kind of arranging this data and these calling, uh, calling conventions in exactly the same way that C expects. And I say C, but most languages, when you're communicating between one language and another, most of the time they're still gonna be using the C ABI. So I, it says that it's representation C, but generally whenever you're interacting from Rust to any other language, you're probably gonna be using C as kind of the common understandable language between these, these languages. So another two you're going to feel really, uh, that is going to be really important to you is GCC RS. So I mentioned before that you can have a build script that runs before you run, or before you compile your main code that will compile your code. Normally you would use a make file to do this. Well, when you're replacing that make file with this Rust build script, you will need some way to interact with GCC. Now you could call out to the shell and you could manually add a command line argument for every single thing you need, and you could be really careful to make sure that when you're in a debug build, you're configuring GCC to do the right thing, and when you're in a release build, you're configuring GCC to be the right thing, and you might have to parse the input that comes back from it. And again, there's a lot of room for error here. So someone's gone out and written a GCC RS crate. So once you have GCC installed, you can kind of interact with GCC in a much more function library kind of way. 
So it looks like this, and this is something you'd probably put in your build.rs. You can create a new instance of GCC. You can give it configuration like, hey, where do I put the output when I'm done compiling? What version of C am I using when I'm compiling? If I need to do some preprocessor defines like you would do pound define in C, you can do that either with or without arguments. You can tell it which files you want it to compile and where to look for your include path, which is very important. And then finally, what do you want it to do with this? So when you say config and give it a .a file like this, you're saying, hey, compile all of the C code, take all of those object files that it generates, and pack them together into one static library that I can use later from Rust. So you will get this a little bit later when I show you what I did with my project. Now, if you want your Rust code to directly interact with the hardware, Again, you could go out to the data sheet and you could look at the big thousand page data sheet and look at all the tables and memory addresses that it provides and you can manually write that out and it might be a couple thousand lines of code depending on what you're using. Um, but again, this is a lot of room for error and we have the tools available to us to generate some code. So most of these manufacturers make a machine readable specification of their processor that goes with the PDF and these are called SVDs and these are typically really, really large and really, really verbose XML files. But if your manufacturer provides one of these, you can take this XML file, feed it into a tool called SVD2Rust, and it will actually go out and generate all of the register or memory level access for your hardware directly for you and kind of generate a more convenient API for you to deal with than directly uh, interacting with memory pointers. So what this looks like as an input is a, this is a 10 lines of probably a 10,000 line file um, of XML saying, hey, this is a peripheral, this is its name, this is the version, this is the address where it's gonna be located. Um, and typically they can even nest even deeper. Things like this byte means this, and this bit byte means this, or this, these three bits together mean, mean this. So a really small snippet might look like this. And what this will generate in Rust is your normal Rust structure and implementation of structures where it gives you methods like reset it to its default value or maybe set address one, which is a six bit field, or excuse me, set slave address, which is a six bit field in master mode. And down at the bottom, this is how you would use that library. And I know this looks a little verbose, but it's definitely less error prone than dealing with uh, direct memory pointer interactions like you would typically do in C or C++. So this is for when you get a little bit lower and your uh, C code that you're bringing along isn't cutting it for you anymore and you say, I want my Rust code to directly interact with the hardware. So those are the tools that are from a high level, I think that it's very important for you to understand, but there's a ton of other tools that I found really useful, but we don't necessarily have the time or the need to dive deep into them. So I'm gonna go lightning round on these ones. So behind the scenes is LLVM. So most people have heard of Clang or LLVM. Um, and this is actually the compiler backend that powers Rust. And kind of a lot of the magic that we have going on today is that Rust already, or excuse me, LLVM already knows how to deal with C and C++ and Rust. So we can get a lot of benefit from that. So LLVM is what's working behind the scenes in, in Rust to kind of make this happen. You also have your ARM Nanyabi GCC family. So if you've used GCC on a desktop, you've probably run into GCC or LD. Well, there's another flavor that works for ARM embedded microcontrollers. So ARM is the ARM architecture, none means no operating system, and IABI means the embedded ABI version of this. So this is just the version of the GCC tools that has been cross compiled to output, uh, output compiled output for these platforms. Um, yeah. OpenOCD or JLink GDB server. Uh, if you've ever debugged a program on your desktop, you've maybe used a debugger, something like GDB. Um, that works really well when the code you're writing and the code you're debugging is running on the same platform and you can connect to it. But with hardware, typically you're writing the code here on your laptop and you're running the code over there on your embedded system. So you need a tool that goes in between you and them. So this is the bridge and we'll be using this later. Cortex-M, this is a cargo crate that exposes a really nice interface to a lot of low level things for a Cortex-M processor. Then there's a really cool new project called Cortex-M RTFM, which when you're looking to completely go 100% Rust on an embedded system, this is a tool put together by Japark to kind of replace what a real-time operating system would be and give you concurrency and things like that in a pure Rust environment. I highly recommend you read this blog post when you get a second if you have interest in microcontrollers. 
So that was a lot of tools and a lot of background on embedded systems, but why Rust? Why now? Well, for one thing, Rust exists now. Rust hit 1.0 stable just about two years ago, um, which means now it's being used more and more in more production environments. Um, when you have, uh, yeah, so why Rust, why now? So when you have this kind of momentum, that's really great for desktop uh, applications. A lot of people are starting to use it and really think of Rust as a viable alternative. Um, I'm looking to make Rust that for microcontrollers as well. We have existing languages that work really well for microcontrollers, but developers end up hitting a lot of pain points in there. So kind of breaking it down more specifically, um, we have C. C is pretty much the undisputed king of embedded systems. I would guess 99% if 99 of embedded systems out there are running C because that's what the programmers know. That's what they're familiar with. That's what the manufacturers provide their references in. And that's the way we've always done it, right? And that's a really compelling argument for uh, engineers who tend to be not really quick to pick up on new things. Even C++, which has worked on microcontrollers for 10, 15 years and has been a really competitive, not a lot of overhead option when compared to C. Um, people really aren't picking it up. It has a really low adoption rate. There's definitely a lot of people who are doing it, especially if they're in the more high-end systems, but it hasn't gotten the adoption because a lot of these classic embedded developers go, well, it really adds a lot of complication. And if I can't use the standard library, I don't get a lot of the cool things that come in C++ anyway. So it's a lot of new things for me to learn and not a lot of benefit. Um, there are languages like Ada, which were used a lot in the military space. So if we have some DOD people who have done embedded systems, you might've seen Ada before. Um, this is not picked up a ton of adoption because for one reason, it just looks a lot different than C. And again, these embedded developers tend to be very stuck in their ways and they don't have a really compelling reason to switch. Even if, it's a, if it provides some benefits like memory safety, like Ada has, they're gonna be really reluctant to pick it up unless they really have to. And then there's interpreted languages like Python or JavaScript or even compiled languages like Go, which are picking up some momentum. And there's even some projects right now which allow you to write JavaScript on an embedded system like uh, an Arduino, where you can have an interpreter that runs on these really tiny systems for some subset of these languages, uh, something like embedded JavaScript or MicroPython. And these are great for prototyping, especially for developers who are not familiar with C, but they need to read a sensor value or they need to blink a light or they want to start prototyping something. Maybe they're, they want to launch a Kickstarter or something like that. I say these are really great for prototyping, but they're not a great fit for production usage because you have to run this whole interpreter and things like that. You end up needing a much more powerful system to do even really simple things like blink light or print text. So they're definitely a good match for the prototyping scene, but I don't think we'll see in the near future used in a lot of production projects. And the other thing is, with the exception of C, not many of these languages have really hit a critical mass. It really takes a lot of momentum before developers go, yeah, that language is a reasonable alternative choice to C for this embedded system. Or manufacturers go, hey, there's a big community of people who are using C++ or Rust, so we should probably provide all of our documentation and code examples and libraries in another language other than C. Right now, they can just say, well, we've always done C, and we'll just keep providing all of our reference material in C because, you know, no one's complaining too loud about that. Ah, here's my other slide I was looking for. Why now? Uh, well, Rust exists now. Um, in embedded systems, hardware is converging on ARM. Uh, embedded systems has always been a somewhat difficult field because everyone's making a different abstraction. Everyone's trying to get the smallest system they can have so they can make it as cheap and as small and as low power as possible which means people will use sometimes some really esoteric um, processor architectures because maybe they're really suited for low power or maybe they're really suited for digital signal processing. Well, in the last five or 10 years, um, most microcontroller projects that are new um, have either seriously considered or just gone with in the ARM Cortex-M family. These are kind of the wonderful meeting point of, well, you can get a really cheap one, it's really easy to move from the really cheap one to the medium cheap or the really powerful one if I need to make choices. And because everyone's using the same architecture, a lot of the tooling is really advanced for that. Or there is even open source tooling. If you're not familiar with embedded development, even today, it's not uncommon for people to have to pay $5,000 for a compiler. 
So per seat. So if you have a four person embedded team, you might be paying $20,000 a year or $20,000 a software version just for a compiler because up until recently, the open source offerings were just not as competitive with these closed source paid components. You might have a 30% slower piece of code or a 30% larger piece of code. And again, when you're trying to shave pennies off a bill of material, you're willing to pay a little bit extra up front if it gives you the end result that you want. But nowadays, there's a lot better open source tools, especially as these architectures have converged. Things like GCC and Clang support ARM, and they support it well within you know, a couple percent of these really competitive ones. Um, there's also a much greater interest in embedded now. And I'm going to credit this in no small part to the Internet of Things and more connected devices. Uh, there's a lot more people who wouldn't have even considered making an embedded device where maybe they think that's what their business needs to be doing today. And as more of these embedded systems become internet connected and always on, security is becoming a much bigger problem. A lot of these embedded systems could say, well, I never connect to the internet, so security is not a big deal for me. I can put everything in plain text and put it in my firmware and it's gonna be sitting at the bottom of a well measuring something and maybe sending some data over a wire on a system that I own. Why would I care about security? That's just overhead. But now when we've got these IoT devices that are constantly connected to a network and are constantly available to be attacked and exploited, and especially as these systems become more valuable, they become connected to your home, they connect, they're connected to industrial applications, security becomes no longer an option. And as we've seen, C is a really powerful language, but it's a very, it can be a very uh, powerful foot gun too if you're not very careful with what you're doing. So I'm going to give a quick TLDR run through of the process that I did, and then we're going to dive into the code a little bit. So your step one is to find and build your C control. You say, hey, I want to play with this hardware. Well, my first suggestion is go out and find an existing C project that has a make file build it, run it, make sure it actually works and you've wired everything together and your build process works. This is your sanity check for later when you're super deep in some Rust and C cross communication and you ag never actually thought to check whether your hardware is really working in the first place. This could come from your manufacturer if you're using the board we're using, Nordic provides a lot of this, or if you're using a more popular platform with open source communities like, uh, like the Arduino family or some Arduino compatible hardware, um, you'll probably find a lot of examples out there. And I do suggest you keep it around to check things later. Uh, you'll want to use this for reference later. So you make a new cargo crate. If you're not sure what you should put in a new embedded cargo crate, come look at mine. You can pretty much copy and paste a good chunk of it and figure out where you need to tweak for your specific platform. Then the next step is going to be replacing that make file from your demo project with GCC RS. You're going to rip out that make file. You're going to look at what it's doing figure out what C files it's building, what it's including, what defines it's setting, how it's configuring the compiler, and roll it all in. Don't assume anything is not important. I've gotten bit pretty hard by things that I went, oh, this doesn't matter, and then I spent a week trying to debug something. So pay attention to a lot of stuff here. Then you're gonna make your bindings.h. So this is, when you use bindgen, you need to basically have one H file that you feed into bindgen that, where you're gonna include all of the other header files that you think that you're gonna need from your Rust project. So take everything that's in your example main.c, figure out all the files it includes and stick those in one header file just called bindings.h. And then generate your first bindings. So I give some step-by-step -step, uh, hints here, but what I'm gonna suggest is take that bindings.h and start running through, cargo dot, or through bindgen. If you're having problems, try commenting some stuff all out and try doing just one thing at a time. And remember, at the bottom, all of the makefile things are important. Bindgen needs the same configuration options that you need for when you're compiling your C code. And then the next step is get a hello world going. Open up a new main.rs in your crate and write your main function. Um, first, try to compile it with nothing in it just to make sure that everything compiles and links together well because you'll probably run into some errors here. And then when that works, write a little one-liner, call a C function, and then load it onto your hardware and set a breakpoint and see, hey, does it actually get to my main or does it blow up when, it, when I first turn it on? And then I suggest you extend, check, commit, and repeat. So add one more thing, and then one more thing, and then one more thing. And then when you have all the background things that you need, excuse me, and when you have all the background things that you need, then start adding your own functionality, build and build and build, but 
do make sure that you commit every now and then so you can always roll back if something stops working. It's great as a sanity check. So, and here's my big red flag warning because there's at least twice in my process where I went, oh cool, I can make this work for now and I hacked something up and that worked for a while and then when I got a little bit further and extended on that, uh, what I thought was working only sort of worked and it ended up making a lot of things not work later. I was pulling my hair out trying to figure out where it was and it was really my own fault for introducing some hacks really on and early on in the process to get it working. So there's nothing wrong with introducing hacks in the beginning to make it work, but uh, make it big and loud so that when you're stuck at, you know, and you've been looking at the same piece of code for two days, you know where to go back and look for things. So for our example, um, the board that you have in front of you and I have in front of me is the Nordic NRF52 dev kit. So what this is is an ARM Cortex M4F, the M4 means it's one of the bigger, more powerful microcontrollers, and the F means it has a built-in floating point. So for microcontrollers, being able to do floating point math is pretty optional because it adds expense and complexity and power to the device. But now it's getting more and more standard on these microcontroller devices. When I talk about the resources it has, it has 64 kilobytes of RAM, which I promise you is a, that's pretty good for a microcontroller this size. And it's got half a megabyte of flash, which again, is really good for this size. Um, it's got its own built-in debugger. That big PCA sticker that you see over on the left, that's actually the debugger chip. The red box that is in this picture, that's actually the entire embedded system. Everything else on the board is just to help you prototype and debug and iterate. So the actual embedded system that you're creating is that tiny little white box over on the right. Um, this is at its core, and the reason why I chose it is because it's a Bluetooth device. Um, at my work, we were working with some Bluetooth devices, and we chose this as our reference platform for something we were working on at the time. Um, so I had some familiarity for it. So I got it out of the box and went, all right, can I put Rust on this? Um, it has a built-in binary blob called the Nordic Soft Device. What this is is an entirely full-featured and self-contained Bluetooth stack. So it manages all of the complexities of Bluetooth for you, and it exposes kind of an interface through these uh, kind of binary blob header files. So um, you load the binary blob on there, and then they give you a header file so your system knows how to call it. And I also chose this because it's a pretty reasonably priced board. For a development board like this, um, it's 35 euros or 40 US dollars. So it's not one of the special purpose 500 or 1,000 euro development boards. Um, so it's pretty accessible for people who want to play with it. And it's got some stuff built into it, like buttons and LEDs and NFC and, um, like I said, a built-in debugger. So it's kind of a good, full-featured, not too small a device. So it's good to play with before you really start optimizing things. So what I have right now, uh, if you can see my picture, I know it's kind of tiny, but I actually have my Bluetooth device plugged in. You don't have to worry about switching over. It's the same Bluetooth device you have in front of you. So I'm connected to it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to open up a JLink GDB server. So this is that thing that I mentioned. This communicates between my computer and this debugger chip on here. And what it does is it exposes a typical GDB server. So if you use GDB on your desktop, it's really similar. Um, but this is just kind of one more man in the middle that helps you connect your desktop computer with your microcontroller system. So I'm going to go ahead and kick that off and it opens up a TCP port for me. Um, so over here, I have the first example. This is the blinky lights example. So this is the Rust code. So up at the top, you can see some stuff you maybe haven't seen before in a regular desktop piece of Rust. Um, I'm declaring that this is a no standard program. There is no main. That's because there's no Rust main. There's instead a, a Rust main that I'm exposing as C, but that kind of confuses Rust. So I'm going to just tell it that there's no main so it doesn't get confused. And then I say that I'm going to use some assembly here. Um, I'm also pulling in this NRF52 dev kit sys project. So this is an actual cargo crate that I've gone ahead and published. Um, but this is all the work that kind of makes what we're playing around with today possible, where I've gone out, used bindgen to build against the bindings, and then compiled all the C code. So all of the C code I can pull in as a regular crate with just a little bit of a uh, wrap around it. And then here's no mangle. So what I'm saying to Rust is, hey, no, seriously, you need to make sure that this looks like C code when you're done compiling it. And then this is a public, unsafe, extern C function main. So there's a lot of qualifiers on there, but this is just saying, again, to, to Rust, when you compile this, we're going to be talking with C, so make sure it's prepared like that. 
But then once we're past there, I can start acting like way like normal Rust again. So from my NRF crate, I just call a function called BSP boards LED in it. So I'm going to initialize my LEDs. And then like any other Rust, I'm going to go into an end. Well, in embedded, it's typical to go into an endless loop. You don't normally want to do this on a desktop application, but I'm just going to go into an endless loop. And then for each of the LEDs in this NRF LEDs number, so this was a C header definition, but now it's a Rust thing. So I'm able to iterate it over, iterate over it like this. I'm going to invert the LED and then I'm going to delay a couple hundred milliseconds. So I can go over here to my console on the left and I'm going to do Zargo clean. I know this is kind of small, but you don't have to see much. Um, and then I just Zargo build example blinky. So I'm saying, hey, in my crate, go build the blinky example. So this will chew through this a little bit. It's completely clean. Um, it's building my package. It's actually going out and generating the bindings against my C code and compiling my C code right now. So that takes about 10, 15 seconds on my machine. Your mileage may vary. And then it's actually going to compile my example. My computer's running a little slower because it's doing video decoding and audio recording, but still, still decently fast. So I get a warning that I'm using some stuff, but you can see that it's finished, dev optimized. So I've done a debug build. I just compiled some Rust code for a microcontroller. So let's go up here to a slightly larger terminal, and I'm going to use GDB to attach to my device and then upload. So I'm going to do, I'm going to search back in my history because it's a lot to type out. But basically, I'm just saying use ARM Nani ADB GDB, use the text interface, and then I'm going to target thumb v7 debug examples blinky. So this is exactly where your binary normally gets put when you're running a desktop computer. But here we have an embedded binary instead of a desktop binary. So when I hit that, you see I've got this sweet curses terminal window. Hopefully this is decently readable. I'm going to hit enter and I have a GDB init script. So it's automatically going to connect to my server and it's going to upload the device for me. So it was already uploaded because I did this example. But normally what you would do is you would do monitor reset. So this says, hey, take the processor and reset it. So it's kind of in a, an idle state. And you can see on the bottom left that it's communicating with my actual target. And then I'm going to type load. This says, hey, you know that binary I just told you about? Actually put it on the microcontroller. So this is going to flash our microcontroller for us. So I load, not very interesting because it goes, hey, that binary is already on there. So um, normally it'll take a couple seconds to upload. And then I'm going to go ahead and like any other GDB session, I'm going to put a breakpoint at main. So it set a breakpoint and then I'm going to hit C to continue. And you can say here, look, GDB just jumped to my C source code. So that's really cool. So I've got this Rust code. I can scroll around in the Rust code. I can step this kind of things. But the nice thing about GDB is it actually knows, uh, it knows about C and Rust, basically through the ELF file format. It just goes, oh, cool, I know how to do that. So I can start in Rust code, and then I can step into the C code, and hey, look, I'm in a C file. So I can pretty seamlessly step through C code and step back into Rust code. So it's pretty seamless and pretty pretty painless to split your time between C and Rust code. So. Now that I've stepped through that, I'm just going to hit continue and let it go. And I'm going to hold my board up. And you can see the LEDs here are kind of flicking on and off one at a time. So that's Rust application code running a C code underneath it. And yeah, we, we got set up with just a couple lines of Rust. And again, you can basically start with just this empty crate, pull in my sys crate like this, and you can write the exact same example. Blinky lights are great. Blinky lights are an excellent place to start for every embedded developer. And whenever I'm not feeling productive, I make sure that I go out to my embedded system and blink some lights because it makes me feel better as an embedded developer. But we bought a Bluetooth board and we want to do Bluetooth things with it. So let's look at a different example. I went into the Nordic, um, the Nordic library and they have this example called an app template where basically they walk you through all of the minimum steps you need to set up the soft device and get Bluetooth going. So there's a lot more lines of code in here, but the story is mostly the same. I have, I have a Rust main, and I'm calling a lot of Rust functions that indirectly call some C functions. Um, and it still looks a lot like Rust, even though it's C under the hood. And even further, I'm doing some really cool stuff that BindGen lets me do, uh, like... 
um, when I register callbacks because the uh, the soft device has a concept of callback. So normally it says, hey, when a packet comes in, you give me a function, like a C function that I can call because then I can figure out how to handle that. Well, BindGen is really convenient uh, in that it will take a Rust function and it will generate. So when you have a function pointer in C, it's got a specific type for that function pointer. It's a function pointer that takes these variables and returns this variable. Well, BindGen exposes that for you. So I can write a callback in Rust. So I have this unsafe extern C. So this is a Rust function that takes a C type and I can pass it into my C code and BindGen, or excuse me, a uh, soft device thinks that it's calling a Rust or it thinks that it's calling a C function, but it's actually calling a Rust function. So I can write all of this high level stuff in Rust. And I know this, I know we're kind of splitting the difference between readability and uh, how much useful content is on the screen, but I'm just gonna go ahead and do what I did before, where instead of the blinky example, I'm gonna run my BLE app template. So I'm gonna compile that, and it's gonna go much faster because I didn't do a clean step before. And then I'm gonna get ready up here, and instead of blinky, I'm gonna do BLE app template. And my computer is really not happy right now with video conferencing and compiling at the same time. I don't know if you guys can hear the fan, but uh, it's going. There we go. So now I'm going to run my BLE application template. So again, I load my code. You can see it paused a little bit while it actually uploaded there. So again, I'm going to do monitor reset. I'm going to start my processor kind of back at the beginning. And I'm going to hit continue. And I'm pulling out my board here. You're going to see one light start blinking. That's a good sign. That's the board telling me that, hey, I'm advertising Bluetooth. And then if I pull up, let's see. Actually, I can do it here. And you guys should be able to see my screen. But I'm going to bring up my Bluetooth applet. And let's actually, can I make this? Nope, that's the opposite of what I want. And I can search. And look, I have a Rust BLE device. So I'm actually running Rust application code on here using the C drivers and the binary blob they provide. And I actually have a, uh, I actually have a device that I can connect to and pair with and all of those good things. And this is all driven by the Rust application code. So I'm going to close this because it's not very readable. Um, but yeah, that's, that's kind of the, uh, the guts of this. So um, if you guys have looked through this example, then you can see some of this, and I'd be happy to comment on some of this, but I think we'll get into this more in the interactive part. But yeah, we have Rust code running, running the C code under the hood, and yeah, we got up and going without rewriting the entire world in Rust. So does anyone have any questions on this before I hop back and finish the slides? I want to kill them. not the best mic. We're still figuring that out. Uh, why did they the soft device? Why is it a binary blob? Is it just to obscure the code? Is it just proprietary, or what's what's different about the soft device? Did you catch all that, James? Uh, we, uh, we can't. Uh, <laughs> I put myself on mute to drink some water. Sorry about that. So okay. the question was, why did Nordic choose to... So the soft device comes from Nordic. Um, why they chose to make it a binary blob and not a fully open source thing, I can't tell you. Um, they might be doing some... They might be either hiding some ugly stuff behind the scenes and they didn't want to expose that. Um, I'm not 100% sure. There has been an open source re-implementation of the Bluetooth stack called NIM, Nimble or N-I-M-B-L-E. NIM B-L-E, I don't know how I'm supposed to pronounce that. Um, but that's used in a, a real-time operating system called Apache Newt or in the Linux Foundation Zephyr. So they use that for this hardware. Um, and that is on my to-do list to integrate that, but this was a slightly easier out-of-the-box solution and I was already a little familiar with it. So um, why they did it, I don't know. Um, that's just what they do. Um, why I chose to use it is because it was kind of ready out-of-the-box. Does that answer your question? Uh, yeah. Great. Anything else before I switch back to slides?
Uh, just one thing. Do you need to wrap everything, every function in unsafe? Or uh, is, that, is that just, uh, yeah, it's, it's a question. do you need to wrap everything in unsafe? Because that seems like you're, you're not taking the benefit of Rust when you, like, yeah. Yeah, definitely. So the question was, why am I wrapping everything in unsafe and do you have to? Uh, so generally, anytime you interact with a C function, that's going to be unsafe because Rust says, hey, C doesn't know anything about Rust, so I can't really trust it to follow any of my semantics or things that I should expect should be done. Um, so you will have to unwrap any C code in unsafe. Um, and anytime you're directly dereferencing, a, dereferencing or writing to a raw memory location, that also has to be unsafe. And this is a fairly common thing in embedded systems. So um, the, what I will say about that is I've done unsafe here and that was a little bit of laziness on my part. I probably could have been more scoped with my unsafe and that might be something that I look to do in the future. Um, but what I would probably suggest for these embedded projects, there will be an amount of unsafe that you have to deal with. Um, anytime you're directly pressed up against the hardware, you will probably be unsafe. But what I would suggest is that when you're developing these kind of abstraction layers, either whether you're, whether you're abstracting the hardware directly with Rust or abstracting some C code, which is between you and the hardware, is that you keep the unsafe code to the, un, to the abstraction layer. And then when you're building your higher level business logic, your, um, what ends up being a, a much bigger proportion of your code, you leave the unsafe kind of only at this low level and build on top of this. Because I'm basically just doing the bare minimum to exercise the hardware, I never really get away from uh, the hardware abstraction layer. So um, if I was building a Bluetooth application on top of this, I would take a lot more care to say, okay, these really low level functions, they're unsafe, but I've done the due diligence to make sure that I'm not screwing anything up. Um, and that's unsafe, either unsafe inside of the function, but then I expose these APIs as safe with the unsafe wrapped inside of the function, which is kind of how the Rust standard library and the Rust core library works. Does that answer your question? The borrow checker though. So, right? Sorry, one more time? You still get the benefit of the borrow checker and stuff though, even if it's unsafe, right? Like, I don't, uh, there, I, the answer is it depends. So unsafe doesn't turn everything off, but it does it does turn a couple things off. So you can have aliasing pointers, which is something that's not normally allowed by the borrow checker, um, but unsafe will happily let you do that. That's another kind of a good thing why I should be scoping this unsafe down so I'm not accidentally aliasing things. Um, but generally, you do still get some benefits from the compiled, but you are losing some of them. So the idea is that any kind of uh, unsafe code that you do write, you need to take some extra due diligence. But at the end of the day, you're not losing everything from the Rust compiler. It's still doing a lot of really strong type checking. Um, and in my opinion, you're not any worse off than you would be than if you were writing the C code, if that makes sense. But yeah, I definitely, I definitely suggest that you scope these unsafe block down as far as you can. And I've not done a great job of that here, but that's room for improvement for me for later. I have another random question. You may have sure. answered it, but I missed it or, or whatnot. So if you're on this embedded device with no OS and you're unwrapping your um, values, like what happens if you unwrap and you can't? Sure. Um, so one of the things that I kind of uh, skipped over is when you're building for these embedded systems, I said, Zar I said Zargo has to go out and build that. Well, there's a couple extra things that you're also missing. Um, and I've kind of silently handled them. And again, you wouldn't run into this in uh, a regular desktop, but one thing is the entry point. So you have to tell Cargo where, or you have to tell Rusty, where's the actual entry point of my program? So I have a really thin one here and there's some documentation that explains where it comes from and you can pretty much copy and paste this verbatim. And then the other thing is a function called panic format. Uh, so when you unwrap something and it doesn't go well, you're gonna panic. So you will need to define this function that says, okay, when it's time to panic, this is what you're gonna do. Um, so what I do here is I do some printing over the debugger. Um, this came from one of Japarik's reference codes. And then I set a breakpoint here. So if I actually unwrap, if I have my debugger attached, it's gonna set a breakpoint that I can attach to this. Um, maybe this isn't something you would wanna do in production, but 
generally the answer is you're going to go into an endless loop. Um, so again, it's going to basically completely halt your prog process, but instead of printing a lot of helpful things, it's just going to stop doing anything. And maybe you could put a, maybe you could blink a light in here or something like that, where it's obvious during development that, oops, it's crashed. Um, so the answer is you set what unwrap is going to do by basically defining what panic does. So I am, I am hiding a couple things in here. So we can get into this when we're playing around with stuff. Um, there are some hidden stuff that I didn't go into, but um, I'm happy to answer any questions during the interactive stuff for things like that. All good? Okay. I'm going to stop sharing my screen again and jump back into the slides. Cool. So I've shown you that this is possible. Um, I've given you some of the tools that hopefully you'll be able to go out and implement this on your system or take maybe one of these boards or go by a board and start playing with the system that I've set up and extending it. Um, but what really needs to happen is I would like for all of you to get started now. Um, I hope that you kind of have the, you feel like you have the first step, you're ready to take the first step and get started. Um, for those of you who are not an embedded developer by background, maybe you don't already have a board already, and maybe you have to decide which one to go buy if you want to get started. Um, well, if you're not interested in Bluetooth so much, or you're looking for something that's a more pure Rust experience, I highly recommend ST Micro's STM32F discovery boards. These are low cost, like five to ten dollar boards. They're available in a ton of places, um, and there's a lot of existing projects where people have taken these and started running with them. Most notably, I mentioned the guy Japarik before. He's doing a really good uh, series of tutorials where he's using one of these discovery boards as his main reference platform. So there's lots of documentation and code examples that you can go play with. Um, if you're looking for the cheapest of cheap options, um, there is a board available from China that uses one of these STM F103, which is a Cortex M3 chip. Um, and these are called the blue pill boards. Um, I'm trying to think, I actually, I'm sitting in my office, so I have all my parts here. Uh, do I have one available? Cool. Yeah, they these tiny little uh, stick of gum size boards that's basically just the chip and all the bare minimum stuff and all the pins broken out. They're basically like a Cortex-M knockoff of uh, like the Arduino Mini or Arduino Nano. I can't remember which one. Um, but these cost about $1.80 a piece. Um, and they have a USB port in them, so you don't really need much more. Um, you will need a debugger, which again, you can buy cheap from China for like two bucks. So if you're looking to get started or you're, if you want to start a group together with some people, you can go on AliExpress and I've got some links here where you can go and, uh, spend like 20 bucks and get 10 boards. So you can use them in projects or throw them away or give them away to your friends. If you're interested in communication, specifically Bluetooth, the Nordic family. So their older series, the NRF 51 or the chip that's used in this board now, the NRF 52 are super well supported. And there's actually a couple projects outside of me that are using this. Um, for example, there's a real time operating system that's being written completely in Rust called TOC, T-O-C-K, like a clock. Um, and the NRF family, I think the NRF 51 is something that they're supporting from day one as one of their reference platforms. Um, if you're an embedded developer already and you're familiar with a board, especially if it's an ARM Cortex-M board, uh, Follow my process and see what you can get working on uh, your board. You don't have to use where I'm starting from. Um, and if you go and search around, there are already some crates out there and already some people searching. So if you kind of have a family of boards, just search Rust in that and you'll run into a couple people who are probably already working on them. So you can try pulling those down and extending or replacing some parts from that. And I'm here to tell you, you don't have to be an expert. Um, there, One of the things that I love about the Rust community is it's, full of very helpful and very knowledgeable people. Um, so if you want to get started, there are people who can help you kind of all along the way. So um, I have a slide later of where to go for help, but um, one of the things that's really helpful for growing the Rust embedded, uh, embedded community is um, one, getting more people in there and more people talking about it. So you can use existing projects to get familiar. You can ask for help. If you're trying to use someone else's code and it doesn't make sense, or like you said, uh, hey, I'm using Unsafe everywhere, why do you do that? Um, provide feedback because 
I might've just been lazy or just trying to get it working. And maybe, you know, that's the right poke that I need to make it a better example. And even those of us that are spending a non-trivial amount of time in Rust Embedded, we're still figuring things out too. Most of us have experience as C developers and we know what embedded development in C is like, but I think that when we're switching to a new language like Rust, we don't have to be tied to the exact ways that we were doing things in C before. Um, for example, there are some people working on some event-driven programming first uh, approaches that Rust makes really accessible and possible, which isn't super useful uh, to do out of the box from C. Also, if you or anyone you know is using Rust in production on a microcontroller, please email me. I would love to have more of these success stories. Um, like I said, uh, engineers, especially embedded engineers, are very slow to adopt new things. And one of the things that, speaking as an embedded engineer, that really wins us over and wins our managers over is saying, look, there's lots of people using it in production and it was working for them. So if you start using one of these in production or even for a cool demo, let me know. I would love to hear about it. I guarantee you if you tweet it to me, I will guarantee you retweets and as much exposure, exposure as I can lend to you. So here's some places to go for help. Um, if you're comfortable on IRC, um, if you go on the IRC Mozilla org, there's the Rust Beginners Room, which is not embedded focused, but is an excellent, excellent first starting place um, for basically anything even Rust adjacent. There's a lot of people there willing to help. And I hang out pretty often on the Rust Embedded channel. So if you say, I'm trying to get this to compile, but it's giving me this really weird linker error, you can throw that into a GitHub gist and then copy a link to us and we'll look at it and go, ah, you're probably missing this or did you set this compiler flag? Um, so there already is a community where we're trying to get that going. Um, that developer I mentioned a couple times, Japarik, his blog is really good. He's writing about some high level Rust concepts and how to get started from day one as an embedded developer using Rust as your first embedded language. Um, there's also a space called the Rust Embedded. This is where we kind of get together our very embedded focused RFCs and compile packages which are useful and um, kind of growing our own community there. And I can plug my own blog. I talk a lot about embedded systems there and I'm trying to write more and more stuff about Rust Embedded um, and plan to take this reference platform that we're working on today and extend it and dive really, really deep into specific approaches that I took and explain why I did that and why you might want to do that or not do that. So keep an eye on that for, there's a bit of an intro post and I'm gonna try and dig deeper when some time allows. So, what, kind of my last parting statement is a quote from Adam Savage from Mythbusters is one of the best things that the maker community can do is build tools, share them with others, and tell stories. So, what I'm asking all of you to do is take the tools that I've built, take the story that I'm telling, and go and build your own tools and tell your own stories because that's what's really gonna make this kind of a, a a more accessible ecosystem for everyone, whether you're already an embedded developer or you just want to play around with embedded systems for fun or for some demos. So thank you very much for sitting through this presentation. Um, my Twitter handle is bitshiftmask. My blog is jamesmuns.com. And anytime you have a question, feel free to shoot me an email at james.muns at gmail.com. I'm always happy. I'm really bad about responding. So if I don't respond, ping me a couple times. I'm very forgetful, but I'm always happy to give really too long responses to questions. So yeah, let me know if you have any questions and uh, yeah, thanks.